Good morning, everyone. It is an enormous pleasure to be at this conference, and I want to thank Earl for being quite so persuasive um, there. <laughs> Most of us are here because we are fascinated by the literary canon attributed to Shakespeare, and we want to understand how it came into being. However, if we read the plays and Shakespearean scholarship, we find that the traditional scholars are not entirely in agreement about quite a lot of issues relating to those plays. We find what we may call the fault lines in scholarship. And it's one of those little fault lines or areas of dissent amongst scholars and traditional scholars at that, that I'd like to explore today in relation to Romeo and Juliet. It follows up my research on Hamlet. So we're going to start with a quick introduction to um, a very enthusiastic German professor whose name is Tycho Mommsen. He was fascinated by the existence of the first quartos of Romeo and Juliet and of Hamlet and the differences between them and their second quartos. In 1857, he wrote a 1,200-word letter specifically on these plays to a prominent journal in London, the Athenaeum. That letter shows he really wasn't very impressed by those first quartos. He writes of the spurious and mutilated Q1 of Romeo and Juliet with all its errors, and of the mutilated Q1 Hamlet with its blunders and mistakes. He considers both of them to be full of vulgarisms, inconsistencies of action, omissions, transpositions, additions, and he sees them as adulterated editions. In comparison, he describes the second quartos, the Q2s of these plays, as authentic, better texts, and genuine ones. Now, every single one of those words should give us a problem. They are expressive and evaluative, and they convey his opinion. Even in the context of his letter, they are not objective, impartial, or supported by anything like unequivocal evidence. Indeed, we might say, like the Duke of Venice in Othello, to vouch this is no proof. To be objective, Momsen needed, and we need, to use vocabulary like difference, or different, variant, shorter, longer. And this is a point, of course, which Paul Werstein um, makes. Now, Momsen goes on to offer an explanation for those first quartos, suggesting that an actor had put down from memory a sketch of the original play of Hamlet and that a bad poet helped him to make up what we now know as the first quarto of Hamlet. And this is the essence of memorial reconstruction, which he and quite a few scholars since have thought explains the differences between the first two quartos of these plays. Um, I have to apologise here for little bits of overlap with Wednesday's talk. Just in case anyone's not familiar with this hypothesis, it suggests that the playwright wrote what we call the second quarter of these two plays. He handed it to his theatre company, who may have adjusted it, then performed it, and subsequently one or more of the actors in the play wrote down his or her or their recollection of the play thus bringing about the first quarto version we know today. It isn't necessarily an entirely linear model, but this is the basic hypothesis of what we call memorial reconstruction, MR, or memorial reconstruction by actors, MRA. And it's this hypothesis which has led many distinguished scholars to write about Q1 Romeo and Juliet as a bad quarto. It's why, in 1874, Daniel says that Q1 is an edition made up from copies of portions of the original play, partly from recollection and from notes taken down during performance. He's closely following Momsen. The belief continues, so we could take in 1930 Chambers referring to Q1 as being one of the bad quartos. In 55, John Dover Wilson, Georgie and Duthie say the Q1 is a pirated version of Shakespeare's final second quarto text, corrupted and perverted by certain actors who'd performed in it. In 57, Geoffrey Buller simply calls it a bad quarto and says, there's little evidence it comes from a first draft of the play. 
In 87, Wells and Taylor write that Q1 is not a reliable text. In 97, Brian Gibbons begins his Arden Romeo and Juliet edition with a firm statement. Romeo and Juliet Q1 is a bad quarto, piratical, like Hamlet Q1. Bad, of course, is just as expressive and evaluative and opinionated as the terms that Momsen uses. Some of you know only too well I have been rather interested in investigating the evidence for the alleged MR of Q1 Hamlet, also condemned as a bad quarto. Now, the first two quartos of Hamlet can be compared in all sorts of ways for their similarities and differences, and I've stuck a quick list up there for you to look at if you like. But none of these provide really significant textual evidence to establish firmly, definitively, the priority of I of the text. But examining the underlying French source, and my emphasis is on looking at sources, but examining the underlying French source, François de Belforet's Les Histoires Tragiques, is interesting, very interesting, because, as every scholar agrees, it is the underlying source for Hamlet. Because a three-way comparison between the French source, Q1 Hamlet and Q2 Hamlet, shows Q1 is significantly closer to the source than Q2 is. Indeed, Q1 has slightly more parallels with the source, yet it's only 55% the length of Q2, so the density of parallels or borrowings is almost double the density of those in Q2. More importantly, it has similarities with the source which are lacking in Q2. And this is a very, very quick um, summary. For example, the um, ages of the princes, um, about the age of majority in the source in Q1. The test with the young woman, Ophelia, is similarly placed. The princes are closer to their mothers, and that's seen particularly in the confidences they give their mothers in the um, chambre, or bedroom chamber scene. And the queens in the source in Q1 know their sons will return. Hamlet and the French Connection um, reports on this, and the parallels between the um, Les Isoires Tragiques and the first two quarters of Hamlet are the most significant of the range of factors which led me to the conclusion that Q1 Hamlet is much more likely to be the anterior text, maybe juvenilia and that Q2 represents the playwright's second thoughts, which means, and I had to put these two pictures up of two um, people who have performed as Hamlet, it means that Ben Wishaw performing Hamlet at 22 is, in my opinion, much more accurate in comparison with the first source than Olivier at 45. <laughs> and since Q2 is nearly the double the length of Q1, it suggests that the playwright was a reviser, a bit of a grafter, especially since there's even a third version of Hamlet in the first folio, and even James Shapiro sees the playwright as extensively revising Hamlet. So what about the source and the relationship of the first two quartos of Romeo and Juliet? We've already seen that like Q1 Hamlet, Q1 Romeo and Juliet has been seen as a bad quarto, and a memorial reconstruction. Thinking about this conference back in the spring, I wondered whether a three-way comparison of the source and the Romeo and Juliet quartos would show anything significant. Now, some of you will be familiar with Arthur Brooke's narrative poem, The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet. In brief, it's 3,020 lines long, and it's written in a Poulter's measure, which has got 12 and 14 um, syllable lines alternating. So, crudely, it's about 3,900 lines in a 10 syllable line. So, in terms of length, we have Q1 Romeo and Juliet, the shortest, at just over 2,000 lines, then Q2 at just over 3,000, and Romeo and Juliet, much longer. With the Hamlet quartos, it is manifest that Q1 is closer to the source, with some 80 echoes. And we've already commented that at 55% the length of Q2, Q1 Hamlet has almost double the density of echoes of the source and exclusive borrowings. 
It's not quite the same with the Romeo and Juliet quartos. The first finding is that these quartos borrow more from their source than Hamlet does, almost twice as much, with at least 152 shared echoes or parallels. Q1 is 74% the length of Q2, so the density of borrowing is such that Q1 has an echo on average every 15 lines, and Q2 on average every 20 lines. Moreover, like the Hamlets, the plays are closer at the beginning and diverge more as the plays progress. However, unlike the Hamlets, the parallels Q1 or Q2 Romeo and Juliet has uh, exclusively are not significant. They rest at a minor lexical or minor concept level. So, for instance, Brooke's poem and Q1 both use send, highly significant word, for notifying Romeus or Romeo of the draft that Juliet will take. On the other hand, the poem and Q2 both refer to Juliet's teary ein or tears at the same point. And that is about as good as an exclusive borrowing becomes. It means that both Romeo and Juliet lean much more heavily on their source than Hamlet does. We could wonder about whether a memorial reconstructor would manage to retain 152 parallels in a text where a quarter of the play has allegedly been forgotten, or at least not reported. Obviously, some details will be essential to the tale, like characters and locations, but not all are crucial. We might consider perhaps the likelihood of a reviser making more advanced alterations as he advances through the play, so that there might be a trend towards more changes later in the play. I made a slight detour here in my comparison, three-way comparison, to look at some of the main changes um, or omissions from the source here, just to double check I had it all right um, here. Brooke's story has elements which the playwright changed or did not use. Um, in the poem, Romeo and Juliet have been married for one or two months, we're told, before the death of Tybalt, and I've really only put this in to say that um, Brooke is anxious to tell us that they enjoyed their nocturnal activities every other night. <laughs> it's nearly five months, five months, enormous time span, before the proposal by Juliet's father that she marry Paris. In the little fight in the play, in, in the poem, Tybalt doesn't kill Mercutio. He's not even on the scene. The reason that Paris is put forward as a husband is because Juliet is pining. Now, the reader of the poem knows it's because Romeo has been banned, but of course her parents think it's because of Tybalt's death. Her mother thinks Juliet is envious of those who are married, so goes along to Juliet's father and said, find her a husband to cheer her up. In other words, County Paris is introduced noticeably later in the narrative poem. And when Juliet asks the nurse's advice about what to do regarding the marriage to Paris, the nurse suggests one man has Juliet as his lawful husband, uh, sorry, to have Juliet as his lawful wedded wife, have the other for wanton love. So Juliet has a husband and a paramour. When Romeo is exiled to Mantua, Juliet asks to go with him, disguised as his servant, but he rejects that. And Paris isn't killed. And these changes from the source apply to each of the two plays. So what transformations has the playwright made? When we turn to Q2, it is noticeable that Juliet has more lines in Q1 uh, than in Q1, 195 more lines. There's about 700 lines difference between the two, so she's got two seven, if you like. The differences in lines show that the Romeo and the Friar also have more lines, although this isn't going to be the main focus here, because it is also Juliet whose character is most different. In Romeo and Juliet, she's not quite always in tears, but moan and plaint are frequently associated with her. She is not exactly a cheerful lass in Brooke's poem. And these are fairly typical ways of how she speaks um, broken with sobs, mourning, crying, feeble voice, dreary cheer, complain, etc. 
Now, this impression is further compounded by the vocabulary in her speeches in the poem, for her focus is endlessly upon death, foe, and the inevitable rhyming word, woe. A scan through her speeches shows she does use lexemes with positive upbeat connotations, but many more with gloomy or deathly undertones. And this extract um, I've put on just to illustrate the point. In bold, you can see the scatter of these miserable words um, here. Bullis sees Brooke's treatment of the story as sympathetic, but one might wonder a bit disrespectfully whether Romeus would have relished escaping to Mantua and perhaps understand why he doesn't take up the chance to have Juliet disguised as his servant. Indeed, a quick scan of the vocabulary with connotations and denotations of death and gloom and doom in Juliet's speeches in the poem shows that it outweighs the lexis associated with light and joy and love by three to one. And this leads me to the second finding in the comparison. When you get to Q1, these two sets of lexis are nearly equal. She's still more miserable than she is happy, but it's nearly equal. And when you get to Q2, there is more emphasis on her love for Romeo and her joy, her passion. And hence the three pictures at the bottom, of course. The vocabulary in Q2, the vocabulary associated with her happiness and love outweighs her Lexis clearly. This is even though she has a noticeably longer soliloquy conveying her apprehension before she drinks from the vial that the friar has given her, anticipates waking up next to a festering Tybalt in the family vault. There is a consistent progression of playing down Brooks. Juliet's joylessness and increasing our playwright's Juliet's joyfulness from the source through Q1 to Q2. I expect you know this guy. <laughs> he ran, um, Stephen Fry, he ran a program earlier this summer um, in England which included mention of how an Oxford psychologist was examining this sort of vocabulary in real people's speech and calling the process sentiment analysis. In English literature, I've probably just called it lexical sets or imagery, I suppose. In the 195 lines exclusive to Juliet in Q2, we see her fondness for others even more than in Q1. This is the next finding. She is a girl bride who is head over heels in love and on stage at least will convincingly risk a potion and the vault with a mouldering Tybalt to be with her Romeo. This is a young woman whose lines are littered with phrases of affection. Sweet, sweet, sweet nurse, gentle Romeo, my lord. And who chooses to say of Tybalt and Romeo only in Q1, my dear lord cousin and my dearest lord. Now dearest is of course a superlative and you might not think that she could intensify her affection for Romeo. Yet in Q2, she uses the superlative for Tybalt, my dearest cousin, and the comparative for Romeo, my dearer lord, showing that Romeo is even more loved. Q2 conveys a heightened love for each man. And there are other details which confirm the trend. In Q1, Juliet refers to Romeo by name 32 times, and once as my husband and twice as my Romeo. In Q2, her preoccupation with him has grown. She names him 42 times. He's now four times my Romeo and seven times my husband. And there's a third or fourth finding. There are additional lines also exclusive to Q2 and spoken by her parents. Romeo, the nurse and the friar, these people who had extra lines anyway, all of which focus on Juliet. And they stress the care and affection with which she is regarded and give greater prominence to her role in the play. Here are just some brief examples of those lines exclusive to Q2. Lady Capulet persuades Juliet to regard Paris carefully and concludes, so shall you share all that he doth possess. 
Juliet is thus introduced to the concept of marriage to the county Paris more gently than in Q1. And Juliet's father asks his wife to tell Juliet of the planned wedding day. Wife, go you to her ere you go to bed, which again softens the apparent abruptness of this sudden marriage. <coughs> Romeo sees Juliet at the window and speaks at length, yet Q2 still has additional lines, including that really long one. Oh, my lady, oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. Later, he is to see her apparently dead and to dwell upon my love, my wife, and the honey of thy breath. If only he had waited a little bit longer, if that. The nurse, of course, prattles on about her beloved child. Well, sir, my mistress is the sweetest lady. Lord, Lord, when t'was a little prating thing, and so on. The friar explains what will happen when she drinks from the vial in much greater detail in Q2. Again, how she will appear as if dead for 42 hours and then awake as if from a pleasant sleep. He continues with outlining how Romeo will be informed and brought to bear the hence to Mantua. Later, the friar will also advise how she is to be brought to the family vaults after her death. And while he still leaves rapidly after she stirs in the vault and wakes, in Q2 he takes longer to try to persuade her to accompany him. And these are just examples to make the point. So it's not just Juliet's own extra 195 lines that show her character is more developed in Q2. It is also the lines of others that combine to elevate Juliet and indeed Romeo beyond the level of a doomed and tragically star-crossed pair, to the epitome of young and passionate love. Today, if we refer to a couple as Romeo and Juliet, it is not to suggest that they're doomed, but to convey their fresh, young, and utterly joyous state of being in love. The changes to Juliet from Romeo and Juliet through Q1 to Q2 indicate, again, a steady and consistent progression. As for the poetry of the play, it is suffused with images of light and sun and stars and brightness. These actually have their roots in Brooke's poem. There, you will find frequently contrasted images of blackness, clouds, shades, death, etc. That polarization of images begins in the source. One line, to show as an example. With equal force, decreasing dark, fought with increasing light. Which leads to the fourth point. The dramatic juxtapositions, antitheses, and examples of oxymoron. These are much more numerous in Q2. Everyone will remember Juliet's line, parting is such sweet sorrow, present in both quarters. But there are many more such lines in Q2. I, I stuck some of them up um, on the screen, left-hand side for Q1, right-hand side for Q2, just to emphasize how many more there are in Q2. And a rhetorical question, which is not quite objective. Would so many of these dramatic phrases and images really have been forgotten or edited out for a Q1? Mm. All of this suggests that the first quarto of Romeo and Juliet is a first draft. But if we are to hypothesize that Q2 came first, we presumably have to see that the memorial reconstructors, or possibly an abridger as Burkhart um, proposes, were rather selective in what they excised in the four areas discussed. They chose to reduce or forgot the role of Juliet more than any other character both in what is said about her by other characters and in her own lines. They chose, or coincidentally, happened to edge Juliet closer to the Juliet of the source. They carefully, or coincidentally, reused over 150 of the echoes of the Arthur Brook poem, which they found in Q2, even though they were reducing the play as a whole by just over a quarter they chose or accidentally happened to remove some of the verbal fireworks and most memorable images. I would respectfully suggest that this is unlikely. A first draft or first sketch is a much more credible explanation of the changes 
that a first draft in Q1 is then followed by a text still dependent upon Brooke's poem, but with substantial refinements. Laurie Maguire, in Shakespeare's Suspect Text from 1996, which really tries to dent major, uh, in a major way, um, the theory of memorial reconstruction, straightforwardly misses, dismisses Q1 Romeo and Juliet as not MR. That's it. The pattern of changes between the first two quartos of Hamlet also reinforce this first sketch view, since both quartos are more similar at the beginning and diverge more towards the end. Both also alter a key character substantially, as well as subtleties in the relationship of that character with others. Both first quartos are published first, perhaps because they were written first. Both second quartos have on the title pages references to the second quarto being revised. I, I don't expect you can actually see it, but on Romeo and Juliet Q2, it says newly corrected, augmented and amended, and on Hamlet, nearly imprinted and enlarged to almost as much again as it was, according to the true and perfect copy. While that phrasing may be publisher's puff on some plays, it doesn't appear to be so on these two quartos. And yet, this playwright is highly idiosyncratic. He's obsessed enough with Romeo and Juliet to rewrite it, and I would use rewriting. Because if we are to argue for memorial reconstruction, we would have to accept that not only are three quarters or 75% of Q2 lines different in Q1, but that the memorial reconstructor has nevertheless managed to retain the same 152 echoes of the poem. If it's rewriting, the rewriter could have the text in front of him, since it does exist this way round, use the same borrowings as before, and develop the play and its characters. Understandable, perhaps, in the days before cut and paste, if the playwright is part revising and partly copying what he's already happy with. At the same time, there are egregious errors in the second quarto, back to Romeo and Juliet. Lady Capulet has several, several different names as speech prefixes, and you have the list up there. In Q2, Juliet is given a line which is Romeo's in Q1. Sleep, dwell upon thine eyes, peace in thy breast. That may be an error, or it may be a deliberate reattribution, because it would contribute to her loving nature. Romeo calls Juliet my niece, which is a bit unfortunate, and it's corrected by all subsequent editors, of course. <laughs> There are even four lines which are virtually repeated. They are the friars in Q1, but Romeo ends one scene in Q2 with them just because before the friar begins the next and almost repeats them. And if you know your Romeo and Juliet, they're the ones that start, the grey-eyed morn smiles on the frowning night, checkering the eastern clouds with streaks of light. It's that little bit. And then there's the Queen Mab speech, which is actually Benvolio's in Q1, and there it's laid out as blank verse, but which is Mercutio's in Q2, and laid out as prose, but still reads as iambic pentameter. And in Act 4, Scene 5, there is the stage direction, Enter Will Kemp, <laughs> which might possibly be naming the actor who has already played the part in Q1. Those of you who have already pored over these quarters will know there are many other factors which are considered in d discussing their relationship. This talk is focusing principally on what we can learn from the source. But these findings do fit in well with a number of other facts, like the date of printing and the title page. Let's return briefly to our 19th century letter writer, Professor Momsen complaining about the first quartos of Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet. He does rightly note that these two plays are followed by second quartos, which at least the literary scholars have much preferred. And the four quartos do have much in common. And in this list, you have all the details of Romeo and Juliet first, and then the Hamlet one second, because it's the chronology of them there. So the Q1s for each pair, printed first, Q2s printed second, Q1's noticeably shorter, Q2's longer and either augmented or enlarged, 
The Q2s, the Q1s and Q2s share the same core borrowings. The Q1s are closer to the source, the Q2s more distant from the source. Q1's main characters clearly recognizable. Q2's main characters refined and their relationships find. I haven't got time to deal with the refinement, I'm afraid. And Q2's closer at the beginning to the Q1s, just as the Q2's diverge more from the Q1s as the plays progress. These features also suggest first draft and revision. The very scenario proposed by, for example, Caldecott, Knight, Delius, L. Staunton, Dice, Honeman, Eric Sands, um, for a start. Studying the source and the first two quarters of Romeo and Juliet, particularly the evolution of Juliet's character, leads to several conclusions. Q1 seems to show, if not the very first draft, then at least the first surviving draft of a play already well developed from its source. Q2 then shows a playwright who's building on that version, subtly altering words, phrases, lines, characters, relationships between characters, and heightening the tragic elements. It shows a playwright who strives for specific effects, is prepared to write and rewrite. In other words, a grafter. It's a very similar situation to Hamlet, though the changes between Q1 and Q2 Hamlet are more dramatic and take us much further from the source. The title page shows the print new Q2 Romeo and Juliet was augmented. The dates of printing reinforce the order of composition. It means that the playwright had the motivation, sophistication, and the time to revise. That's very similar to Hamlet too. Yet Q2 shows some elements of carelessness, which cannot be attributed entirely to the printer, as if the playwright had achieved the effects he wanted with the poetry and the drama and couldn't be bothered to tidy up loose ends. These are also criticisms of Q2 Hamlet, of course. This wasn't a Ben Jonson carefully revising for his collected edition in 1616. It is consistent with the oft-quoted view that the playwright doesn't seem to have been concerned with the printing of his plays. And it ties in neatly with Andrew Crider's, I'm sorry, I haven't got your name right, um, Andrew Crider's comment in the latest Shakespeare Oxford newsletter about Jonson's comments in De Shakespeare Nostrati, suggesting an undisciplined writer whose work wanted, needed, editing. With Juliet, the playwright was definitely concerned to create a character whose passion for her Romeo transcends the ties of family, the obedience of a child to her parents, and the expediences of a convenient second marriage. A character who is loved by all around, who loves passionately, who risks a potion and entombment with the dead for her love. We find a playwright who is concerned to use his verbal powers to give us a play of immensely contrasting, aspiring desires and distressing deaths. This is evident in this study of the source, Q1 and Q2, Romeo and Juliet. It has clear parallels with Hamlet too. Together, the sources of these plays and the plays themselves suggest a playwright who wrote early pieces, who was obsessive, a grafter and reviser, careless or dilettante, as well as, if I'm allowed to use the G word, a genius. <laughs> Logically, this is where this talk should stop, and I am nearly there. We've looked at why the playwright might be seen as a grafter and at three Juliets, but the results do point further. Shakespeare studies have evolved enormously over the two centuries since Malone. The challenges to the authorship of William Shakespeare of Stratford and the use of computer analyses are leading to close textual examinations which indicate a great deal by, about the playwright. The romantic views of Shakespeare, the imaginative interpretations of his character, the critical opinions of those like Harold Jenkins, who believe that all those theories which have contributed to the conception of Shakespeare as an artist much given to the revision of his own past work are quite without evidence or plausibility, and to those who believe the hypothesis of memorial reconstruction, these positions are very gradually being reviewed. Indeed, it may be that those who want to argue against memorial reconstruction and for revision are pushing at an open door. After all, views have already changed on King Lear, and that was about 50 years ago. Maybe memorial reconstruction, the preferred view of many in the 20th, 20th century, a Q1 as a bad quarto and a memorial reconstruction 
needs not just to be rethought, but outright abandoned. Eric Sams argued this some 20 years ago. He and his reviewer describe memorial reconstruction as an outmoded myth, a tissue of fabrications, not a material hypothesis. Arguing from the evidence of the plays, he declares, the various MR speculations are thus not only unnecessary, untestable, incompatible, and unevidenced, but also counterfactual. They are further flagrantly self-contradictory. Consequently, it is the house of cards known as Memorial Reconstruction, which now lies in ruins. I'd love to agree with this if it were not that Memorial Reconstruction is still promoted. And that really does bring us back to the beginning of this talk. For we are looking here at one of the fault lines in scholarship. There simply isn't agreement yet about the relationship of different versions of the same play. And that will affect the chronology. See Kevin's book. And it may mean we have actually, in the first quarter of Romeo and Juliet, the equivalent of Juvenilia, a sample of the playwright's early work, a bit like Q1 Hamlet. For both of these, the sources which scholars, I feel, have been neglecting vouch and provide proof of their chronology. Maybe change will come. Thank you. Okay, we have about five minutes for questions and answers. I want to check uh, Mark Anderson here first. Eddie, that was a, a great paper and, and really a, a, a model of, of what careful examination of these texts can, can, can really bring to the authorship issue. Um, I'm wondering if you could speculate or, or just expand on um, what exactly does the um, does the introduction, or the, the demolition, as it were, of the memorial reconstruction uh, hypothesis or its reduction, um, how, how specifically does that affect um, the ways that Stratfordians are now seeing these plays? If, if they begin to accept that, that these are revisions, this suggests a first draft, a first draft that may be years antedating you know, the, the final draft or the second draft. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you could maybe continue on that because I, I, to me it seems really big, but I would love to get your, your expert opinion. Well, my guess is that any of the Stratfordians who is looking at the possibility that um, these might have to be revised as ideas is sitting there rubbing his or her hands thinking, whoopee, that's the next 20 years of my research life mapped out. because. There will be, um, if we start looking at things like famous victories and what famous victories turned into, mm -hmm. and started arguing seriously for that as a first draft, and the three plays consequently as revisions, there is a tremendous amount to do to look at what Shakespeare was doing when he handled the material, when he changed these um, plays. Um, I was talking to Rosemary, who's been ever so kind and brought me in this morning and listening to my <laughs> burblings, and I think one of the things I really want to get across is that most of us come to the second quarter of Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet or the finished versions of Henry the Fours and Henry V and we think, oh wow. <coughs> and then we have to go back, or then we might go back to the Q1s or the earlier versions. Um, a very small number might go back to the source. But our mindset starts with the brilliant version and it's mm. almost anticlimactic. Whereas what I've tried to do is to, certainly with the Hamlet, I read the French and I read the French and I read the French and I tried to block out everything with Q1 and Q2. And then to go to Q1 and see what had happened and then to go to Q2. And you get this immense sense of growth and the cleverness, the ingenuity. Um, the development in every aspect of the poet is not as marked for Romeo and Juliet, but the same thing needs to occur. One has to soak oneself in the first one and then move on. I think once the Stratfordians, and I, I mean, I genuinely do think that this is going to be a turning point, I think that the Stratfordians will find there is a great deal to do suddenly. And it will change things, including the chronology. 
Sorry, Earl, I went on a bit. <laughs> the problem with the MRA theory is that you're looking at the plays as literature and not as art. The natural progression, anyone who's involved in theatrical production knows that the natural progression of any new work is that it begins with a table read, it then goes into workshop, then you see it in an early performance as a playwright and you go, oh, that didn't work at all. Now I have to rewrite it, rework it, the character doesn't read or it's not sympathetic enough or whatever the case might be. Yeah. And I think what we see here in the progressions from one quarto to the next is not Shakespeare the writer, but Shakespeare the theatrical director who is refining the artistic performance that he saw in his mind as he penned the plays. And that's the problem with the, Str the Stratfordian scholars is they go straight to the scholarship, not the art. And um, touching on some things we talked about yesterday is our advantage, I think, would be to look at these not just as literature, but as performance art, and that's our key. I absolutely agree, and I haven't had time to mention people like Lucas Earn as well, who would see them as possibly at the Q2s, even as being reading texts too. But it, it is part of that regression. Absolutely agree. I think I'm not as, as, as you were speaking, Edie, this is very exciting to me, because when I was in Mantua, I saw a statue of the poet Virgil, and in Virgil's last 11 years, he was revising the Aeneid. So I think we've got another layer that is going to come up. I to agree. Say, yes. say nothing for Philip Sidney's revision of the old Arcadia. So. All right, Edie, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation.